The Unshackled Waves, episode 158. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. With the royal wedding between Prince Harry and Meghan Markle gaining much worldwide public interest and media attention, and Australia having a slice of the action with the head of the British royal family being our head of state, it has reignited the old constitutional monarchy versus republic debate. Australians rejected a republic at the uh, 1999 referendum, but the push for one has continued, especially with Peter Fitzsimons as head of the Australian Republican movement. Advocates of Australia's constitutional monarchy have been just as active defending our current constitutional arrangements. Wilson Gavin is a representative from the Queensland Monarchist League who has recently appeared on uh, Weekend Sunrise, Nine News and uh, Sky News Outsiders promoting the case for constitutional monarchy. Now, as a Republican, albeit a lost cause one, I thought it'd be good to invite Wilson on the show to have a discussion about the case for both monarchy and the Republic. Wilson, welcome to the show. Good to be here, Tim. Now, you and me, we both would have went through uh, school learning about uh, Australia's system of government. We were uh, taught there's the executive made up of the prime minister and cabinet. There's the legislature, which is both houses of parliament. And then there's the judiciary, which is the federal court and high court. And then there's uh, the crown, which is the, the British monarch, however, uh, represented in Australia by the, the governor general, whose main job is to uh, sign legislation into law. Uh, now, how did you conclude, given um, through your civics education, that uh, constitutional monarchy was the, or the status quo that we have was the best system? Uh, well, I think I'm not simply a, a constitutionalist, um, strictly speaking. Uh, I, you know, obviously, um, I, I think I've always really been a been a monarchist to some extent, always been a traditional royalist, um, so to speak, but. For me, it's not so much the civics education I got in school. I think, you know, most Australian schools do quite a poor job of educating um, their students on what, you know, our constitution is, what our system of government is, the separation of powers, uh, and the other ways that our government and our cu country function. Um, for me, it was more getting actively involved with politics, uh, you know, meeting politicians, seeing you know, in the flesh uh, how great our system of government is and how well it works um, to restraining, you know, the excesses that a Republican form of government would have. Uh, that probably, you know, had more of an effect on me. You're probably right about the, the lack of civics education. I, I, I'm probably... Uh, probably learnt the, the most about it because I was a politics nerd uh, growing up, so I went out and sought, <laughs> sought out this uh, information. But yeah, uh, probably the the average uh, student wasn't, wasn't probably as interested uh, as us. Now, constitutional monarchy, is it, is it a principle that uh, you have throughout all, for every country, every country that does have a constitutional monarchy, that's what's best for that country? Or is it a system that is uniquely beneficial to us? Well, I think, you know, um, democracy itself and you know, a parliamentary uh, monarchy is very much an innovation of the Anglosphere. And it does work best within the Anglosphere, um, you know, Australia, Canada, New Zealand and the United Kingdom itself. Uh, those, you know, those are the countries where monarchy is most closely linked uh, to those institutions that have made you know, Britain and its colonies some of the greatest countries in the world, uh, rule of law, common law, uh, the parliament itself, um, and that co that continuity um, between the crown and parliament. Uh, but I think constitutional monarchy works well, generally speaking, in almost every country. Uh, you look at the Scandinavian countries, you look at, uh, you know, the low countries, you know, Belgium, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, uh, if you look at Japan now, even uh, Spain or the minor European principalities, it really is a system that guarantees, you know, security of both, you know, liberty and economic freedom. Uh, it secures, you know, freedom of religion, freedom of government, freedom of association, freedom of worship. It is the form of government that is best suited to ensuring maximum liberty uh, for citizens of that given country. 
Now, what are some of the dangers you see with a presidential system? And there's uh, different types of presidential system. There's the, the American type where the head of government is also the head of state. There's the ceremonial uh, president, which uh, Germany has. And then there's the mixed uh, presidential prime ministership sharing arrangements that a lot of uh, Eastern European and uh, former uh, Soviet uh, countries have. Well, I think the danger of either models being proposed by the Republicans, either a directly uh, elected head of state or a head of state appointed by the parliament itself. The danger with either of those options is that it does place you know, all of the power into the hands of politicians. So if, you know, if it's directly appointed by the parliament, the president, that is just handing over lock, stock and barrel all power to the parliament itself and the existing political establishment. Uh, Obviously, the alternative of having someone elected as a uh, head of state, that, does, that doesn't mean that, you know, an icon or, you know, a former general like Governor Cosgrove, Governor General Cosgrove, uh, you know, former prestigious lawyer like Quentin Bryce, former archbishop like Peter Hollingsworth, uh, you know, those sort of cultural figures would never be head of state under a republic, a directly elected republic. Those figures would be unelectable. It would be people you know, like Bill Shorten, like Malcolm Turnbull, who would be president. You don't think that we could keep it uh, as it is the the way, uh, just a change from the instead of the the Governor General uh, being titled that, being the Queen's representative, there they're just the 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 president. I mean, uh, as I said in my introduction, I'm a Republican, albeit a lost cause one. Uh, what I would like to see, and you probably believe that this is never going to happen, is that uh, if we do have a directly elected president, it's more just a contest between eminent Australians who's going to be the, the, the best figurehead. Like I sort of see that we'd probably end up with a, a president, Eddie Maguire, for example, although a lot of people might not like that. Well, I think the danger with that is more so um, that to run a successful campaign, the head of the state, you require a campaign apparatus and you require well, you require money. Uh, so, you know, popular cultural figures wouldn't have the sort of resources to bring to bear in that sort of campaign. It would be either, you know, the mega billionaires, it would be James Packer, it would be Clive Palmer, or it would be people from the established political parties. Um, either way, I think Australia's public life suffers and its political life suffers. Uh, do you have any examples of where the, the transition to constitutional monarchy to a presidential republic has failed? Uh, you know, there's, there's a number of examples um, of the transition to constitutional monarchy to republic failing. Not There have been very few peace, genuine, genuinely peaceful transitions from a constitutional monarchy to a republic. Uh, the best examples are probably in Italy in 1946, um, where the post-war monarchist Italian constitution was replaced via a referendum, which was likely rigged by the American occupying government. Um, but, you know, obviously Italy has seen 46 head of states in the past 70 years since the end of the Second World War. Um, you know, high, probably the most unstable gov governments in Europe have come from Italy post the shift from constitutional monarchy to a republic. Uh, you also saw in Greece um, the shift from the monarchy to a republic, uh, and you know, sort of a bread basket, of, you know, I'm uh, sorry, basket case of Europe now to a republic. You know, very rarely favours, you know, centre right, sane politics. It favours, you know, the politics of demagoguery and populism uh, and the radical left. Uh, that's one of the other arguments that uh, constitutional monarchists uh, have against a republic is that the overall process would uh, favour the uh, the cultural elites and radically change uh, Australia's institutions uh, and culture. Uh, uh, there'd obviously be a push to try and get a, a Bill of Rights uh, installed and other uh, changes to the constitution all in one go. Well, I, th I think it sort of sets sort of something of a precedent. Um, you know, the crown is at the core of the Australian constitution. Uh, you know, it's mentioned well over a hundred times. It really is a linchpin that holds our constitution, which I genuinely, genuinely believe is the best written constitution in the world. Um, it's the linchpin that ties it all together. And once that is removed, uh, you know, constitutional law is completely up in the air. I think the only solution if we do become a republic is to have a new constitution, simply because 
uh, it will not function without the Crown at its centrepiece. And, you know, all the constitutional safeguards um, and precedents which have been, you know, established by the courts since Federation will be pretty much meaningless without the Crown. So I think without the Crown, we'll have a new constitution. In that constitution, I think it's absolutely, you know, a certainty that you know that the the left would try and sneak in some sort of crazy bill of rights uh you know that doesn't serve to protect liberty so much as it enforces uh equality and enforces you know, reactionary left-wing ideals the 1999 uh, referendum uh, on the Republic, that tried to accommodate uh, minimal change, and that had a, f a president who would be uh, elected by a uh, three-fourths majority of uh, joint sitting of uh, federal parliament. Uh, obviously, that it wasn't um, acceptable to constitutional monarchists and also some Republicans who uh, wouldn't accept anything other than a directly elected president. Obviously, that wasn't as radical as what you've put uh, for, forward uh, just then, but that that was still problematic in your opinion? Uh, yes. Oh, well, clearly, clearly there's a monarchist that would never have been my uh, preferred situation. I probably if it came down to a model between a directly elected president and a president appointed by three fourths of parliament, um, you know, I, I would support the latter. But I think you know, the, the key issue is that the Australian voting population saw that model as just transferring more power directly to the politicians. Now, even with the current system, which is you know, fairly similar in many ways, uh, in that the prime minister of the day recommends the governor general to uh, the sovereign. Uh, I think the, the key difference in that situation is that there is that outside um, sort of safeguard that we have with the sovereign having final say. And the, you know, the sovereign cannot be bought, the sovereign cannot be influenced. Uh, you know, the sovereign belongs to n no parties and has uh, you know, zero partisan ties to any party. I think without that safeguard, Australians became a little bit nervous about supporting any model for a public that would place uh, that onus entirely on the parliament. And you firmly believe that only a monarch can uh, facilitate that, that stability uh, overseeing Australia's system of government. Do you think the fact that it is because it's handed down through uh, inheritance that monarchs, they they realise that they're unelected and they're all the all that you know they should be focused on is is just safeguarding making sure that governments are elected uh, sta stably and keeping out of the the day-to-day -day politics oh, i i totally agree you know i think um those in the direct line of succession to the throne so charles william and george in the future have all been educated very very firmly on what their role is as constitutional monarch and their role is as sovereign you know, it is to to advise um, the Prime Minister of the day, uh, to warn and to counsel, um, but ultimately to remain above politics, not just outside of politics, but above politics, and remain as a you know, unifying figure for people around you know, the different Commonwealth realms. I think that with a shift away from that, a shift away from the head of state ultimately being educated for their entire life uh, towards a life of duty and a life of service, Seeing that replaced by someone like you know, Malcolm Turnbull or Bill Shorten, as I say again, uh, you know, someone who is not groomed so much for service, but is groomed for ambition, um, and has placed themselves, you know, not at the services of the, the Australian people, but of the, you know, but at the behest of the power brokers in their own party. I think that's definitely a seismic shift in the way that we as Australians would perceive as the roles of responsibilities of the head of state. Now, the argument that uh, a lot of Republicans put forward is that anybody should be able to aspire to be Australia's head of state. It shouldn't be handed down through uh, inheritance, let alone be somebody who's uh, based in, in another country. You don't see that as that important to the, the way Australia is as a country? Well, for me, my core issue is that I don't particularly trust anyone who would aspire to be head of state. Um, I, I don't trust anyone who comes out and says, I want to be president of, a, of Australia someday. There's something you know, in me that 
sees that sort of naked ambition um, as something to be quite wary of. You know, I'd much rather trust Her Majesty the Queen, who, you know, she's served us so faithfully over the last few decades. But at, at the core, she really would be happier as a you know country gentlewoman uh, in England. It's it's the fact that she didn't, um, you know, she she didn't climb the greasy pole. Uh, she hasn't been chasing her ambitions and backstabbing people for to get where she is. It's like that she was born, she was educated to her role, um, and no, no one can replace her apart from those who have been equally well groomed and well educated. Yeah, I certainly agree. The the Queen hasn't uh, put a, a foot wrong in the uh, 60, 65 years she's been on the uh, on the throne. Uh, now. What would it take for you to reconsider monarchy? Because yes, the the British royal family overall has uh, has been an exemplar uh, example of uh, stability. But there is always the case that, and this is how I believe that a republic's only ever going to be achieved if if the the monarch begins to interfere in in daily politics. This is what happened in uh, Nepal and led to uh, them be, uh, becoming. Uh, a, a republic, and uh, I'm not sure if you've seen the the British uh, House of Cards miniseries to play the king. That is where the king starts to interfere with the uh, the system of British uh, government. Uh, in if that could would ever occur, would would you want to repair the monarchy, or would that that make you reconsider the system that it can no longer work? Well, I. To you know, continue with the House of Cards example, you know, I, I I don't think anything would shake my idea in the monarchy itself. You know, I think the monarchy itself has proven uh, over you know, almost two thousand years to be the most workable uh, system that we have, and you know, more than workable, I think it is a truly inspiring and beautiful system of government. Um, my views on a certain sovereign uh, who acts outside of the purview. Of their authority that has been dictated to them by custom and by tradition and by parliament um, might shift with that. But I think that you know, the monarchy is at the foundation of our civilization in Australia and of all the Commonwealth realms. Um, so I, I really couldn't consider any sort of idea or any you know, possible future where I would be anti-monarchy itself. The question of a individual uh, king or queen stepping outside of the limits of their authorities is a quite different one, you know, and as we've seen in British history itself, uh, you know, with the you know forced exile of James II in 1688, uh, with the forced abdication of uh, King Edward VIII in 1938, um, there there definitely is room um, within the system of the the Westminster system of constitutional monarchy. Uh, to enact those checks and balances on an individual sovereign, but the idea of monarchy itself, you know, like 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 sovereigns above the politicians, the idea of monarchy itself is above the cut and thrust of everyday politics. I'll give you a more concrete example. Uh, Prince Charles, he's uh, known to be a, a climate uh, change activist. He's, he's spoken about it uh, at uh, public events. He even uh, spoke about it in front of uh, President George W. Bush. Is that inappropriate in your view, or is the, the monarch keen to uh, or able to uh, express their, their view on uh, a certain issue as long as they don't attempt to like, interfere in government policy? It will, yeah, very much the latter. I think um, Prince Charles's views, as a, come as a, come from his standpoint as a conservationist and a genuine traditionalist, I think um, his views, some of his views on the environment, while questionable, uh, do come from that deeper foundation of his inheritance of a thousand years of tradition and custodianship and guardianship over the lands which he will rule, and the idea that he wants to pass them on in good condition uh, to his descendants. I think obviously, you know, some of the science behind him is a little bit lacking, um, but I couldn't see him stepping outside of the constitutional boundaries which have been set over the last few hundred years. And if he did, um, the only alternative for him would be to abdicate. So I, I, I don't see Prince Charles actively becoming involved in the legislative process when he becomes king beyond you know, anything that his mother has done. 
So although you disagree with his views there, he's, it, it's not problematic for you in the overall scheme of things. No, if, if, it's, if it's his personal opinion that he's you know, expressing in a public forum, um, I don't think there should be any uh, you know, attempts to dictate the monarch's free speech in that regard. You know, they're, they're not merely a, a prisoner of tradition. They should be able to express their opinions publicly so long as it doesn't in interfere with the constitutional uh, and le legislative pro process. Now, you and me are, re are relatively young, and we were only young children when the British royal family was uh, plagued in uh, sex scandals in the early 90s. Obviously, there was not just uh, Charles and Diana, there was uh, Prince Andrew and uh, Sarah uh, Ferguson, which really damaged the the image of the the, the monarchy in the in the British community, which culminated in the, the crisis when Princess uh, Diana died. Was that a challenge for the, the monarchy, do you think? Or was it, was it just a case of, well, the, the, the British monarchs, uh, royal family, they're, they're real people and occasionally they're going to uh, s slip up, but it's, but it's not a, going to be a crisis as some people were speculating? Well, I think I think you know the events in the '90s with the royals' private lives was, without a doubt, the most damaging period uh, in the history of the House of Windsor since the abdication itself. Um, I, I think, both in terms of the effects on personal popularity, uh, in the way that the death of Diana and the response of the royal family to that death shook public confidence, and also the way that it just damaged mystique. You know, the the royal family thrives on theatre and thrives on mystique. Um, you know, hearing some of the, you know, tapes between individual members of the royal family, hearing Diana's, you know, tell-all interviews, uh, all of those nasty details that came out, the fallout from the divorce between the Prince of Wales and Princess Diana, it, it was incredibly, incredibly damaging for the royal family. And I think that for, for a while there, even after the referendum in 1999, it did look like it would become inevitable that when Charles became king, uh, that we would become a republic. But I think that, you know, obviously the effect of the two young princes has been incredibly, incredibly good for the royal family um, and for constitutional monarchy. People see, you know, Prince William serving as an ambulance pilot, um, you know, Prince Harry serving in Afghanistan, you know, all of the charity work that they've done, reams of it, you know, they've devoted their lives to it um, and have proven far more effective in that role than m almost any celebrity, almost any public figure. Um, you know, obviously, the the marriages that they've had, you know, Prince William to just a normal middle class English girl, Prince Harry to a you know glamorous, more modern cosmopolitan American actress. The children, you know, I, th I think with William and Harry moving forward into the future, I think the monarchy is in very safe hands. And I would argue that that crisis between Charles and Diana, it was, it, it all came about because Charles, he was denied his uh, choice uh, of bride in the first place. I mean, he always loved uh, Camilla Parker Bowles and uh, obviously was told to marry Diana. She was the more socially uh, acceptable one. So I've got a sort of a bit of a soft spot for Prince Charles in that regard, given that he was denied his uh, true love for, for so long. But it, but it seemed that the monarchy learnt uh, from that. I mean, Meghan Markle, much was made that she was a divorcee, she was uh, uh, an, an American, and also that she was uh, born a Catholic as well. And the, the, the monarchy has reformed that uh, Catholics are allowed to be married into the uh, royal family, and that also men and women are now equal in the royal family. Oh, exactly. You know, I think there's a, there's a book was, which was written by an uh, Italian aristocrat in the mid uh, 20th century just after the second world war um and at the, the core message of that book is that for everything to stay the same everything must change i think the british monarchy has an incredible talent for self-preservation uh you know it's it's called the firm for a reason it really is um one of the greatest corporations in the world in that you know it it knows its shareholders uh, and it, it has a very decent business model you know, the, the monarchy un understands and has understood uh, since the 90s, the very latest, that it needs to modernise with the times. It cannot be seen as out of touch. And that's been in evidence since the, the reign of Queen Victoria, um, you know, with the way that she caused ne a public backlash with her going into mourning. Since, you know, her, ch her children you know, were the first royals to 
you know, go out and open hospitals, open bridges, open roads. Uh, you see it in the Second World War when King George VI and Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, insisted on staying in Buckingham Palace in London during the Blitz. Uh, the, the royals need to be seen as relevant, and they understand that. You know, they they know um, that their du their duty is to to serve the people, and you know. I, I think the royal family has done a marvellous job of adapting to, to the modern era. You know, obviously the Queen is from you know, three generations, uh, four generations above me, um, and yet people of my generation are still able to to relate to her on a deeply emotional level. I heard a slogan about the uh, the royal family that it's uh, adopt or or die, which it, which is true. I mean, it can't stay the same uh, forever if it wants to survive. It's got to um, maintain relevance and also with the with the social norms, which does upset some uh, pure uh, traditionalists. But uh, that's just the the reality. If we if oh, if you want to keep things uh, the same and believe in constitutional monarchy overall oh exactly you know i i'm very much a, a traditional royalist um you know i i like the the pompous circumstance i like the tradition but i i do understand from a sheerly practical perspective my goal is to ensure uh the survival of constitutional monarchy in australia on behalf of the sovereign um and i you know there's certain concessions that have to be made to the modern world in in an institution like the monarchy if it is to continue and remain relevant and you know it's kept all the it's kept all the best parts of tradition it's kept the parts um that are most meaningful to people that are most important um to carry on uh whilst also presenting a, a modern face to the world so i think you know the monarchy is to be commended it's a very fine balancing act to to make and going back to what you said before, it's it's also important that the royal family is seen as having real uh, day jobs. That there, there's always these jokes uh, uh, spread around that the royal family are the ultimate uh, dole bludgers. But yeah, um, Prince William and Prince Harry, they've uh, done military service. Prince Harry even was on the the front line uh, in, in Iraq. So and uh, the the monarchy, they're they're aware of that uh, as well. And uh, to bring up uh, another example, when uh, there was a, the Windsor Castle fire in the, the 1990s, the, the royal family made sure that they paid for the restoration themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, it, uh, you know, I think something, there's something in the military service of the royal family that is, is very special. You know, every time um, a Western government goes to war, launches an intervention, uh, there's always that cry of, you know, would our politicians be willing to send their children to fight this war? Um, the royal family has, you know, Prince Andrew fought in the Falklands War, uh, Prince Harry fought on the front lines in the Middle East. Uh, the Queen herself is the last reigning head of state in the world to have served in the Second World War. She served as a women's auxiliary, um, as a mechanic. So I think the royal family puts its money where its mouth, mouth is and does have a genuine, genuine um, devotion to service and duty behind it. Now, I've... Uh... Obviously, with the marriage of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, it's uh, it's gained a lot of media and public interest, but it's also uh, reignited the uh, monarchy versus uh, republic uh, debate. And you've been uh, one of the the representatives on uh, on television defending the uh, the the monarchy. And public opinion is still firmly uh, divided on, on on the issue, which in my in my opinion means that if we had another uh, referendum then it would probably uh, fail, given that uh, when people are asked to change the, the, the constitution, they always err on the side of uh, caution. And the fact that the, the royals, as we've talked about, Prince, Prince William and Prince Harry are, are, are popular. I mean, uh, otherwise, all the women and gossip magazines, they wouldn't put the, the royals on the, on the cover every week. Yeah, and I think, you know, obviously there is um, a difference between personal popularity and whether that will translate to support of the ballot box for the monarchy. Um, but I, I think definitely the plurality of public opinion uh, is firmly behind the monarchy. Um, you know, at, at least in Queensland, where I am, uh, polls indicate that there is still very, very strong public support for the monarchy. Even, you know, with the visit of um, Prince Charles and the Duchess of Cornwall earlier this year, 
they're, they're not the most popular members of the royal family, but they still managed to attract a crowd of around 4,000 people on a rainy weekday in Brisbane and 2,000 people up north in Bundaberg. Um, you know, there, there still is a, a deep ground swell of support for the monarchy, at least in Queensland. And even in Australia more broadly, um, I think outside, it's the Republic is a very niche issue. Um, you, you won't hear people outside of political circles advocating for it. It's an issue that is very much a preoccupation of people who are concerned with you know, social and social justice issues, who really you know, aren't in touch with what you know, the voice of re regular working class Australia is. I, I'm the type of person I'll I'll vote for it, but it's it's not at the uh, the the top of my agenda. And as I mentioned before, it's it's got to be done uh, right as well. Going back to uh, uh, what you said, there's a difference between popularity and the the ballot box. But I, I'm of the belief that Australians they they like that they have a slice of the action of the monarchy. I mean, it's part of the 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 royal family's job to to visit uh, all of the uh, parts of of the Commonwealth and uh, as you mentioned before, uh, the, the public uh, flock to them. Well, exactly, and I think the royal family has a has a definite fondness for Australia. Uh, you know, we were uh, Prince Charles went to school here for around six months at um, Geelong Grammar. Um, you know, it was Prince William's first visit as a baby was to Australia. It was Diana's first foreign tour. Uh, you know, Prince George came here as a baby. Uh, you know, the royals have grown up with Australia. Um, and it, having that sort of place at the table with the Commonwealth, you know, invited to all of the great, you know, royal events and pageantry, Australians like that. And we do like to be part of that. Even, you know, I, I've noticed the phenomena in Australia of when the royals do visit, it's always the Republican uh, politicians who act most fawningly over them. Uh, you know, uh, you know, seeing... Julia Gillard, the avowed lifelong Republican, curtsying to the Queen. No, she didn't curtsy. That well. was that. That was a big controversy. She did curtsy. She did. And and even uh, you know when Prince Charles visited early this year um, Brisbane, seeing Anastasia Palaszczuk walking that you know two steps behind Prince Charles and just with this this big grin on her face. Um, I I don't think anyone you know begrudges the popularity of the monarchy. Well, I think they, they do it because they believe in public service and adhering to the Constitution as it is. I mean, the Greens, for example, want to change Section 44, but they've been the most uh, the party that's uh, obliged by it most strictly. Well, well, speaking of the Greens, I do think it um, is fitting that the, the, the Greens spokesperson for the Republic is Lee Rhiannon, who is a, a Stalinist. So, uh, you know, looking at the agendas of the people who are pushing this republic uh you know even malcolm turnbull uh who you know probably isn't my favorite liberal prime minister of all time uh he's he stopped talking about it and at his last address to the australian republic movement um he very much put a dampener on it against you know against the republicans hopes he put a dampener on them and told them in fairly uncertain terms um that australia's constitutional monarchy is in place and will stay in place for a long deal of time into the future. Well, it's a Labour Party policy to support and create an Australian Republic. Uh, Bill Shorten's tried to uh, reignite the, the public's appetite. He's promised, I believe, at three votes, there's going to be a, a plebiscite first, then there's going to be another vote on which type of model uh, that uh, we want, and then there's going to be a third vote on actually changing the constitution. and. Three votes, uh, I, I can see right from the beginning, the, the, the public's just going to say, stuff this, this is ridiculous. Oh, exactly. You know, I think, yeah, and it does go to show the hypocrisy of Bill Shorten, um, that he criticised the marriage plebiscite for $140 million, whereas uh, if this, you know, Republic push goes all the way through with two plebiscites, a referendum, and then we'll have to have a presidential election after that, um, it costs over a billion dollars. It's, you know, Shorten's billion dollar... Uh, prestige vanity piece uh, and Australians see right through it as you say Australians are not going to put up with that and obviously as a avowed constitutional monarchist I mean you're in the, the the Queensland monarchist league you'll be out on the front line if there if there is a vote uh, campaigning for uh, the retention of the monarchy what's uh, what's going to be the the campaign strategy well you know the campaign um, will be quite similar to last time. I think 
it would be a great mistake to focus um, on the inner, inner, inner city and inner suburban areas uh, where the sentiment would be for a republic. You know, if we focus on you know, the wealthy upper middle class, we will lose uh, the referendum. But if we look at in 1999, the people who supported the monarchy, it was people out in the regions, in rural areas, uh, and in the outer suburbs. So those are the people who still have the closest emotional attachment to the British monarchy. Uh, those are the people who you know, are least eager for change and will see the least amount of benefit from any change. Um, so I think you know, any campaign that we have in Australia to defend the monarchy needs to focus on the battlers. Uh, obviously, social media will be a massive part of any future uh, pro-monarchy campaign. Um, it, it, you know, the social media aspect won the last um, the 2016 election for Trump. I think it could very well do the same uh, for a monarchy vote. Now, the demographics uh, today are quite different from 1999, given that uh, we are, uh, I don't even like the term, a multicultural society, obviously. Uh, we've had a lot of people who've come from Asia, India, uh, the, the Middle East. Uh, are they going to be as receptive to the, the monarchy as uh, traditional Australia was? Um, to an extent, well... It's, it's an interesting question to ask, really. Um, the rate of support for the monarchy amongst migrant communities, uh, non-British migrant communities in 1999, was roughly similar to the normal Australian rate. Um, you know, if you look at certain uh, migrant communities in the Commonwealth, you know, uh, we have a large Indian population, we have a large Pacific Islander population, a large New Zealander population. Um, hopefully those historic ties with the Commonwealth would sway um, a vote towards the monarchy. Um, but, you know, I think generally people come to Australia because they think that we are the best country in the world. Uh, you know, people come to Australia knowing what our system of government is, knowing that we are a monarchy. Um, and I think, you know, most first generation migrants are incredibly grateful to Australia and would certainly be willing to, to support you know, the established system of government. Well, Wilson, I'd like to thank you for exploring this uh, topic uh, with me. It's been really good to, to hear your uh, case. And obviously, I'll wish you all the best with the campaign. Uh, I'll be voting differently, but I've appreciated <laughs> your time today. Thanks so much. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. There is still plenty more happening around Melbourne and elsewhere in Australia, which you should all aim to get to. Tickets are on sale for the big tour by Stefan Molyneux and Lauren Southern in Australia this July. They'll be visiting Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth, Brisbane, as well as Auckland. The tour is being hosted by new events company Axomatic Events. Please make sure to grab your place before they sell out by visiting axomatic.events. Lauren and Stefan promise to make a big impact to our national discussion while they are here and it is certainly about time that we had that. Axomatic is launching with a splash. If you're in Brisbane, you can meet the famous Mama Warrior Against Safe Schools, uh, political posting mama, aka Mareka Rancy in person. She will be appearing at the Mount Gravitz Bowls Club at 7pm on Thursday the 21st of June. Tickets can be purchased at axomatic.event slash political posting mama. It has just been announced another big name is on his way down under. Former UKIP leader Nigel Farage is touring in September and visiting Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth and and Brisbane and Auckland as well. It is being brought to you by the same people who brought you Milo Live last year. Tickets, including various VIP passes, can be booked at nigellive.com.au. The True Blue Cruise annual Aussie Pride Flag March is nearly upon us. It was one of the first events we covered out in the field in Melbourne last year, and we'll be back again there this year. The date is Sunday the 24th of June at 12pm and begins at the Royal Exhibition Building. This type of event probably matters more now than ever, given the persecution of nationalists we are seeing around the Western world. Uh, the campaign against racism and fascism have been trying to uh, s stir up a crowd there by putting up posters around Melbourne saying it it's a, a Nazi rally, so it's important that uh, ordinary people uh, turn up to show that there's nothing wrong with being a nationalist. Also, don't forget, if you want to take the Unshackled even further and score some awesome rewards, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash the Unshackled. Also, don't forget, we have our online store, Upright Market, where you can purchase Unshackled merchandise and other gear for right-thinking people. So thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. 
Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.